What is the advice of a psychologist to a hurdler? Try not to fall over the hurdle? No, never. The advice is, imagine yourself reaching the goal as quickly and safely as possible. So the task is, imagine yourself making COP29 a big success for global environmental policy. Welcome to the panel, Good Words to Good Deeds. What objectives can be set for COP29? Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Esteemed colleagues, so good to see you here this morning. I see so many familiar faces, which is great, but even more importantly, I see many unfamiliar faces, which is a testament to our chairs of NGIC's desire to expand the Baku Forum and its increasing relevance, so welcome. I also know that everyone was enjoyed dinner last night. It was a late night. So double kudos for being in the audience. We're min missing right now Minister Sultana, but I know he's here. I talked with him early. So we'll, as soon as he walks in, we'll all applaud him as we escort him to his chair. But we're going to get started um, anyway. From my perspective, COP29 is the crescendo of a series of COP meetings. And this is then Azerbaijan's chance to show the world climate leadership. And this panel is designed to facilitate that discussion. Now, we have nine panelists and we have 90 minutes. You can do the math. It's, it's a challenge. So I'm going to be very diligent about timelines and I'm going to be rather ruthless, but lovingly ruthless. So when I cut you off, know that I am giving you a hug at the same time. All right, so that I will be lovingly ruthless about cutting people off. I will say, however, I grew up and many people have said to me, if you have anything important to say, you can say it in two and a half minutes. Now, I'm just saying, if you got anything important to say, you can say it in two and a half minutes. So I, I think that's sort of a rule to live by. Um, I'm going to just introduce people real quickly. I think I totaled up. 160 years of experience in the climate fight on this panel. We have bold voices, bright voices, and I want every single one of them to have the opportunity to speak. Um, what's missing on my little piece is I was over 30 years with ExxonMobil um, as a vice president at ExxonMobil. I have now spent the last 10 years on a green energy, a green metals, and a green technology company, as well as being my great privilege to be on the board of NGIC. So we have Akeem Steiner, who flew in for today, many years of experience, the administrator of, please join us, no problem. Glad you're here. Um, administrator of the United Nations Development Program, UNDP. Thank you so much. Um, we have uh, Minister Saltanov, we were on a panel over the past few years. We're really privileged to have you here. Congratulations on being the CEO of COP29. That's a really important role and Deputy Minister of, of Energy, so thank you for being here. Um, Sir Sharma, member of the Parliament of the UK, also president of COP26. So really important, again, a lot of experience. And you can see how I got to 160 to 200 years of climate um, exposure. Fatou has incredible experience on partnerships. So a really important piece of how we can accomplish climate change initiatives. I think everybody knows Maria. Um, uh, has spent a lot of time on, um, uh, on climate-related issues and was president of the 73rd session of the UN General Assembly, as well as ministers of several areas in Ecuador. Um, and Mamuna, my BFF, um, uh, she has done some great work on cities and local communities. Hakima, I know she's around. I hope she's going to attend. She's an important part of this as well. well hopefully, And I know she was co-president of Paris, so has a lot to say. And Francesco, as the Director General of the International Renewable um, Energy Agency is in the heart and soul of action that has to happen to make this all work. So I just wanted, I know it's written down, but I wanted to put names to faces. This is an uh, incredible um, group. Now, the agenda for the next 87 minutes 
Um, I'm going to make a few comments so you understand my biases. Um, then I'm going to turn it over to Akeem, who's going to give us a framework for our discussion today um, as well. And then we're going to have five people talk about the hows and some of the challenges and obstacles that we, we, we face. And then I'm going to have Sir Sharma and the minister in the cleanup batting order. Uh, sorry to use an American sports analogy, but that's the most esteemed role to play, is the, the cleanup hitter in the batting order. So with that, let me just start. I've got five top line issues, uh, five top line messages from my perspective. One, cop matters. And no cop will be more consequential than the, the COP29 coming up. I know it's a highly imperfect, frustrating process, and much of our discussion today will be about the challenges of delivering meaningful collective action. But I really wanted to start this panel by reminding ourselves of what has been achieved. The world is undoubtedly on a better trajectory than was the case before the Paris Agreement and has reached unprecedented consensus on the need for high climate ambition and high, high climate action. So COP matters, but number two, incrementalism has its limits and we must think big. So those who say COP has delivered too little, too late, are also right. We all know that the world is way off track to the 1.5 degrees Celsius, and last year the UN Environmental Program said we're headed to 2.9 degrees. That means that we have our foot on the carbon accelerator, every one of us has our foot on the carbon accelerator. Three, we must build on the progress of COP28. COP28 may have recognized for the first time the need to transition away from fossil fuel in a just, orderly, and equitable manner. And both of those are important, the transition and the just manner. But the fossil elephant, look around, is in the room. Uh, because we still haven't reached consensus on the need to phase out oil, gas, and coal and set a timeline. And if you look at the incentives, the subsidies are still in the trillions of dollars for oil and gas. Four, we can't wait for a silver bullet. We must act with what we have now. I've heard many people, and this could be indeed an existential risk, that the world avoids the action we need to take now because something will happen down the road. Technology will exist, um, and, and we don't have to move now. Technology is important. We have to invest in it. We have to share it, but we need to act now. And then finally, from my vantage point, 2035 targets that we set will be our last stand. So a huge amount rests on t COP29. I've heard people say, that we're on the road to COP30, COP29 is it to me. It's extremely key. It's a point of no return. And this is then Azerbaijan's chance to really show the world leadership. The right time, the right place, the right partners. Azerbaijan is steeped in oil and gas, but steeped in a commitment to develop huge renewable resources. So the key is how we take action. Hi, hi, Kima. So with that, Akeem, let me turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Jean. Yeah, good morning to all of you. Good morning to this wonderful, distinguished panel. Um, in two and a half minutes, maybe you'll give me three, just a little bit of framing. And I want to pick up where our president of the General Assembly just left off, a world disrupted, a world disturbed, a world searching for at least shared interests where it can still act. And I want to begin by saying, in fact, climate change is one of those areas. We are going to be meeting later this year here in Azerbaijan for the 29th Conference of the Parties. To anybody who, over the many years, has doubted whether this climate change convention, um, whose beginnings go back to 1992 and the, the Rio Earth Summit, would not help the world to come together clearly has been proven wrong 28 times already. Now, as you said just now, Jean, yes, progress has been slow. But it is because the world is struggling to come to agreement with each other, not because of the instrument of the convention and nor the cops. Just look at what happened between Sharm el-Sheikh and Dubai. Less than 10 months and a new fund was established and many other decisions were taken. The other 
ingenious part, I think, of the way that multilateralism has enabled the world to deal with another dilemma was the Paris Agreement's ratcheting up mechanism. When the world met in 2015 in Paris, there was no way that we could close the gap between where the science was telling us we needed to be and where reality was allowing us to reach an agreement. There, we gave birth to the NDCs, the nationally determined contributions to be reviewed and revised every five years in order to raise the level of ambition. Sir Alok Sharma is sitting with us here this morning. In Glasgow, we managed already to do something that proves that this mechanism is working, because in Paris, we were at a 3.5 degree world. The NDCs that were submitted towards Glasgow already took us down to a 2.5 to 2.8 degree world. And I think as we look forward to both the COP here in Azerbaijan and then COP30, the next 18 months will be the next test of whether the NDCs, defined by national priorities, realities, but committed to the collective and shared objective of addressing climate change, could in fact end up with a scenario where 1.5 degrees is actually something that you could arrive at if you add them all up. Here comes the second point. Financing, very much at the center also of COP29, the so-called, and I always have to look at it because one of the things with COPs is they create these terrible terminologies, a new collective quantified goal. It's another way of saying the $100 billion, frankly, have not been reached yet, but they were never the ceiling. They were not even the floor, but we are struggling to get on top of that. We need to find a better way in which to address the issue of financing, of investing and investing together in scaled up ambition. Again, the NDCs are an excellent way in which to define financing needs, opportunities that each country can bring to the table and that the world as a whole can then look at and assess because a 1.5 degree scenario with all the NDCs on the table by Brazil is not inconceivable, but in it will be a very clear calculation of what it would take to invest domestically, internationally. So financing remains really the key enabler or paralyzer of collective action. And that is why the COP here in Azerbaijan later this year is so critical, because if we do not advance on this collective quantified goal, then indeed we will probably undermine the confidence in the NDCs being developed in an ambitious way. And thirdly and finally, let us also recognize that as we meet here in the year 2024, we live in a world where essentially a transition in the energy revolution, in the decarbonization pathways are happening. Climate action has converged with national sustainable development pathways. There are a number of countries who already today produce most of their electricity, in fact, above 90% with renewables, with clean energy. Uruguay, Kenya, we have seen Europe and the European Parliament now commit legally to a close to 90% emission reduction target by 2040. We have the Inflation Reduction Act. We have China's massive investments, India's investments. The energy transition has gathered so much pace that last year we invested a total of $1.8 trillion. Um, my dear friend at the end of the podium will no doubt speak to that in a moment. And let me therefore say when we look at this long-standing dilemma that the future success of economies and nations is in part compromised by having to act on climate change and decarbonization is increasingly becoming a less and less absolute hindrance. On the contrary, any economy thinking to the future today, and we saw that also in the United Arab Emirates, we are looking forward in the work that also we with UNDP are doing here in Azerbaijan on low emissions development strategies and adaptation plans the forward-looking view of acting on climate change with ambition and the notion of transition at the center is increasingly at the center of actually thinking about positive futures for economic development. So let me stop here, Gina. I think these are three ways in which I think we can inject a degree of optimism in a moment in time when the world really is struggling to come together. Climate change is existential. It is happening everywhere and it requires everyone to come to the table. Thank you. Thank you. Before I move on to Fatou, uh, coming to you next, just let me ask you a quick question. This nexus between climate and development, 
has been a big issue that continues to come up. Can you talk for just a minute about the blockers of that working together, that nexus, because I think it's so important. Well, first of all, there were the real challenges of sometimes the cost. If you go back 20, 30 years, yes, investing in renewable energy was more costly per kilowatt hour. But that was because the cost of producing electricity with fossil fuels was not fully priced. In today's world, in most economies, we have overcome that. Renewables are per kilowatt hour in most countries now probably the cheapest, if not almost the cheapest option. So the economics is out of the way. Technology is advancing enormously fast. The idea that you know, a country like Germany would be producing 50% of its electricity with renewables, Denmark coming, coming close to 70%, 10 years ago was viewed as technologically impossible. The lights would go out. Today we are seeing enormous advances in terms of storage, in terms of um, grids that are operated over vast distances, therefore compensating also um, in terms of variability. There are still breakthroughs needed, but as I said, there are countries that have chosen to invest in this field because it provides enormous opportunity. And I'll end with one more example. In Namibia today, a small country, but with enormous potential, you're seeing green hydrogen emerge, not only as a way of utilizing its almost endless potential of renewable energy, but as an export industry, as a way of financing its own power supply, creating more energy security, potentially creating thousands of new jobs and technological opportunities. So the idea that investing in a decarbonization pathway is going to take you backwards is today truly a mythology. Now, I'm saying this very conscious of the fact that we are in Azerbaijan, and there clearly is still a big question. How do countries and economies that have grown around their ability to supply the world with fossil fuels transition in this age? And I think hopefully the panel this morning will shed a little bit more light on this. But I think human history has shown that just because we had something in the past there is no reason to assume that this is the pathway to the future. And I think this is the particular moment in which, again, the world has to work together. Energy security is more than just one person having a certain fuel or energy source and others having to purchase it. We are moving into an entirely different world, and it's going to happen over the next 10 years. Excellent. Excellent comments. Fatou, I'm 